glad to be here. Um, I've lived here all my life, all 76 years. I've only moved 500 feet in my life, so <laughs> I'm a slow mover. But, a, but as all my relations did all the migration west, well, there's no further to go. I'll get wet if I go much further, so, that's, mm -hmm. so I'm just staying put. I'm quite happy here. My great grand so Michael Grass was my fourth great-grandfather back. My great-grandfather, Peter Lewis Grass, um, in 18... Approximately 1882, decided to move west to Calgary, Alberta. Well, it wasn't Alberta then, it was just straight Calgary, because the CPR was building a railway across Canada and it was progressing towards Calgary, and apparently that was a spot for everybody to head for. So they took the train partway across and they came by covered wagon to the rest of the way to um, Calgary with his young daughter, three year old daughter, Luella. And it was while in Calgary that he got a job. He was put in charge of native reserves as an instructor, as a farm instructor to the Stony, Saddle Lake, and Crooked Lake Reserves. Luella lived and grew up with the natives, and she was a blonde-haired princess to the natives because they really took to her because she had blonde hair. But in the meantime, the smallpox epidemic was was raging across Canada, and the government decided that all the natives would be vaccinated. Well, there was no way they were going to allow themselves to be pinpricked by the white men, but so what they did is they took Luella, who was three years old, and vaccinated her first in front of the natives. And they thought, well, if this child can be vaccinated, so will we. So they all lined up and got their vaccination, but they turned out each tribe that they were looking after all required the same thing, so Lella got vaccinated three times <laughs> as each tribe and each as each one saw her being vaccinated, they all joined in and allowed it because they thought she was so special. Another part of Calgary is uh, Gilbert Goddard, that was my grandfather who I never knew. He came from um, came to Calgary in eighteen eighty three also from Torquay, Devon, in England, and he came via San Francisco. When he arrived, he was to be a, uh, a missionary. But when he got to San Francisco, he saw what fun everybody else was having up north with the gold, with the gold discoveries that she, he headed for Calgary too. And when he, he, when he got to Cochrane, he, he got a job on the Bow River Horse Ranch. And, and by 1889, he had become the owner of the ranch. It consisted of 30,000 acres with five miles of riverfront on the on the Bow River between Cochrane and Calgary. And he, there they raised horses for the Northwest Mounted Police and for the military purposes. And during the first, uh, first World War, when it came along, they were shipping horses overseas for military purposes. He married Luella in 1900. She was 19 and he was 43, but they, that was what Peter Lewis Grass wanted to be done, so that's what they did. And they, they raised four children, of which my father was one. And now we get closer to home here. Victor and his brother Everett, they came out to Victoria in 1910 to attend the opening of St. Michael's University School. And Dad did not like that one little bit because he they were used to being raised on, well, on the ranch and they were homeschooled and then they got shipped out by train out to Victoria and put in university school and that was not his way of life. But he stuck it out for about six years apparently. But whilst he was there, he rode the VNS Railroad out to Sydney on a couple of occasions. And that's the railroad went through Royal Oak here. The VNS, Victoria and Sydney Railroad, or the Cordwood Limited is another term they used for it. And there were also three Two other railroads going to Sydney from Victoria because you couldn't drive there. There was no road in those days. You either took the interurban, which went out to Deep, um, deep Cove area, or the Lockside, which was a CNR. The CNR track went up where Lockside, and that was for bringing freight into Victoria. There's a picture here of the court of the the engine that was used, part of the Cordwood Limited. The farmers along the track out past Elk Lake, Beaver Lake, they, that was part of their job was to create cordwood for the keeping the train keeping the train um, loaded. And his dad used to say, well, the train would co coming up out of the rise from the Douglas Street side here up into Royal Oak, 
if it had too heavy a load, it couldn't make it up to the top of the hill, so it went back down the hill, build up another load of head of steam, and then take another run at it. So it was, and the same thing coming the other way from Sydney this way, there was another hill they had to climb up by the Keating Valley. They, very often they couldn't get up that in the first tries. I got a couple more pictures here. Of the, that's another one of the railroad coming through that. I think that's the same as this picture up on the wall here. Anyway, um, in 1918, the Goddard family moved, sold the ranch in Alberta and moved to Sydney as a retirement because uh, Gilbert was accustomed to the sea, um, living on the sea and Alberta was a long way from the sea. So they retired to Sydney and dad got a job as a customs officer and their place of operation, he, he also, he worked the Sydney War, he worked the Sydney War and eventually had to go to work in Victoria and that was kind of a long way to go. Well, it was 1931 when that happened. So dad decided when they got, they got married in 1931 to my mother, well, I guess it'd be my mother, <laughs> and she, he, he bought a piece of property on Halliburton Road, which at that time was during the depression and a lot of people were, it was from, it was a tax, land tax sale he got it through because a lot of the landowners at that time were just abandoning the property and leaving it. So the amount of taxes owing for three years taxes to Saanich was $40, $45. This is for six acres of land. He got six acres of land for $45, plus the Hudson's Bay had a lien on the property for $20 for unpaid grocery bill from the previous owners. So that's how much they had thought land was worth. It was to put a lien on the property to hold it for three years. So to get this property, it cost Dad $65 to buy the six acres of land up on Halliburton Road, where, where they... He built a house up there and raised the family, and that's where I say I'm within 500 feet of the original house home site. There are some other pictures here, also of the well. I guess it should have gone to the picture. This is of the Royal Oak Hotel that was right here in the corner, and of um, the Stevens Hotel, which was up here on in the Beaver Lake Road. On so they're just photocopies. I took out pictures we had. And another picture of a huge tree that was being cut down up in this area somewhere. It's a huge cedar tree, and it shows so is the the men lying in the the groove they cut out to, for the undercut. Past that one, right? And another one of the uh, Petrick's hand, which is now in the corner. That's where the hotel used to be. I get rid of all the pictures, and we'll get back to the story. And another pic another picture of the. Um, Prairie Inn, when it was in operation, that was also on the railway track, and that was another state, that was the Sanditon Station where that one was located. But the trains used to stop here. Part of the deal was that when the train came through Royal Oak area, it would had to, um, the Duvals were the, came through their property, and they said, well, if you're going to come make an easement through our property, you, the train's got to stop going by each way for, for 10 or 15 minutes for the passengers to come and partake at the, get a drink at the hotel. So that was part of the deal on the, the railroad coming through that Royal Oak. When they first came to Sydney in 1920s, Freeman King and Dad started the Sydney Scout Troop in the 1920s. And when Dad moved here in Royal Oak in 1931, he started the Royal Oak Scout Troop. They built the, they had their scout hall. It was built on West Sanitch Road, right opposite Markham Road out this way a bit, and they, they built that back in 1937. They built a scout hall there, and it was in, and he was a scout master here in Royal Oak through to 1960, which, at which time he, when he retired from the customs, he retired as being a scout leader also. And that, ho that scout hall was eventually taken down, I think it was around 1970, when they, they took that hall down. When, they, when the Victoria was building the water main out, the new water main up to service Sydney, and they went through where the scout hall was. So that scout hall came down and the scouts moved into this building here for several years. When I became of age, he started a cub pack. So there was now a cub pack and a scout troop. And my sister Judy, she wanted to be in something. So there was no brownie pack available in this area for guides. So dad dressed her up in the brownie uniform and she became a cub. She <laughs> I had a picture or something. There it is. And so she, she she joined in all the cub activities, of which here's another picture here of one of called it Cub Brownie 
the version of Made in a Million Men. This was in 1947. She went off to a, a, a in Victoria, there was a cub rally, and the photographer, the colonist photographer was there and saw this girl in the middle of this mob of cubs. So that, someone, we got a picture, we got a picture one Sunday in the paper with that. Nobody, know, nobody knew where she, this girl came from, and nobody, okay, carrying on. My, my first day of school here, at that time, was East Sandwich Road and West Sandwich Road. There, uh, no interact. And East Sandwich Road came down where Viewmont is now. And Dad would drop Gordon and I off at the post office, which was just near the brow of the hill on the East Sandwich Road there. And we'd walk across through the lot, the empty lot where the, the gas station is now, and over the foundations of the old burned-out hotel. <coughs> and Gordon, being four years senior to me, he didn't really want having to do with his little younger brother, so. We came up the, to the entrance of the um, school grounds here. He said, you go in that building up there, go up the steps and go in that room over there. And he went over to the two-room annex on, on the road. So I, it was kind of, there's no, not like nowadays where the parents are with the children 24 hours a day. No, we just, they just turned us loose and we went through. But my first memories in this building was, <coughs> it was during the war years. The Second World War was on by this point. And the, <clears throat> we all had a gas mask, which was hanging on the coat hooks out on the wall. I don't know if any of you remember that. And we occasionally we'd have air raid practices where they'd bring, well, I see the bells over there in the corner. Um, and we'd all troop out and we'd walk across West Sanit Road and go behind Mrs. Blake's place, down into the gully where the railway tracks used to be. And we'd all lie on the grass there and wait for the all clear and then parade back up to the school again. So, and. Remember the uh, in this school the Christmas concerts we used to have in the Women's Institute Hall. They were that was a great event having those Christmas concerts over there. And I remember Miss Adamson was our teacher here. She she trained us on how to sing Silent Night, and we were really instructed to make sure you pronounce the T's at the end of Silent and Night when you were singing this. I, thought, I still remember that a little bit. And the other thing was, um, the municipal hall was right across the road here, and the police station was in the basement, and the uh, health health nurse was in the basement too. You, if you had a problem, you didn't go to the doctor. When, if you something happened at home, well, wait till you go to school and go see the health nurse when you get there. The school had no telephones at that point, but our phone number is Colquitt's 24R. And there were 10 people on the party line that, that covered everybody on Halliburton Road. So, and so when you wanted the phone, if you, you to phone Victoria, that was long distance. So you phone the operator and tell them the number tell her the number you wanted and you could get maybe two you might get two calls into then then the operator says, I guess you got tired of answering the phone or saying, You've you've had your turn, you get it. And you can maybe get two calls of Victoria and after that you're on your own for till, for half an hour while somebody else got you. And to phone to Sydney was long distance. I think Sydney was ten cents. No, no. Victoria is 10 cents and Sydney with 15 cents for long distance calls. The <clears throat> thing we had when we were coming to school is um, the teacher told us that if you ever had a fire and you phone, the, you phone for the fire department, make sure you tell the operator where you lived. Because the operator hasn't got time to climb up onto the roof of the Colquitt Exchange and look for the smoke to tell them to phone the fireman where to go. <laughs> that was our cue and that was our instruction. Make sure you tell them where you are. Our playground for this part of the woods was we we boys we we had free range there's no fences anywhere so we just went everywhere but our playground was basically the Rithitz farm where the broadmeat is now all those houses all the massive that was we climbed over the mountains and we did all we'd go looking for Christmas trees out there three months in advance and pick out the one we were going to cut down later on and does anybody remember there was a copper mine up on one of the hills up behind the cemetery. It was, at least that's what we're told it was. One of the projects we boys had one year was to, we, it was full of water, this, this up on the mountain there. It was, we decided to siphon it out. And so we gathered up our, we decided, we took our garden hoses from home, we gathered them up from all of ourselves. We were, had a garden hose and we hauled it back up on the mountain behind, we called it Bald Mountain. It was the one right behind the Royal Oak Cemetery on the back side there. And we proceeded to siphon out this copper mine and it went well it took a couple of weeks to get all the water out of it so we drained, drained it and we had this this pole went into the ground about 50 feet I guess and down at the bottom was a big cavern at the bottom so but it was 
but we just want to know what was down there. So we, that was our project that summer to drain the mine out. But I see, when I was up there, the mine is still, is there still a marking on the rock up there. It's off of Amblewood right now. But it's still there, and there's still a sign on top of this rock here, drained by George Farley written his name and Robin Bramall had written his name on it. On, I guess the date that it was drained by. And I don't know if anybody's ever, it's never been drained since. It's full of water again now, but anyway. We, you know, we gathered up some of the rocks up there and I took them home and Dad took them downtown to get them assayed or whatever you call it. And they came back with his copper. Yes, you need 100 pounds of this rock to get a pound of copper. Oh, well, we're not going to pack home rocks for it. We didn't know how to get copper out of rocks anyways. <laughs> But actually, I think that sounds pretty good now, but he's been a pound for 100 pounds. But anyway, so we, that was the end of our copper mining expedition. We, we didn't know how to get copper out anyway, so that's, that was one of the things we did. And then during the summer, <coughs> our jobs were, our main, as it was, a, everybody had a berry farm or cherry farm. Or, anyway, you start off the season with, cher with strawberries, and it went into raspberries, and then the Loganberry set. I remember the Heels farm had, Bob Heel had the biggest Loganbury farm of the area. I didn't get involved in picking those, but we'd be picking them. At the end of the season was uh, blackberries, and we pick, we were picking on cherries. It was all, yeah, there was something to work all summer at picking. One summer we were picking the blackberries, and there was one row. There was 20 feet of one row. We kids refused to pick, and Mr. Amos wanted to pick, and we said, "No way! There's a huge hornet's nest in there. It must have been a foot and more in diameter." So, but he's, well, I got blackberries in there. I said, well, we're not going in there. <laughs> so, they, these, these are cultivated ones there. Anyway, so we remember asking Dad about this. And he said, oh, I can fix that. So a while later, he came back and kaboom! He brought back a shotgun, double-browed shotgun. That hornet's nest just, it just disappeared. He shot it out of the blackberry patch. <laughs> it worked great. So remember that next time you have a horse, get, get out your shotgun and take it. It just blew it to kingdom come and that was the end of that wasp. No, there wasn't a hornet in sight. <laughs> They're all tenderized and gone. Anyway, we, Mr. Amos is quite happy because then he could, we could then pick the 10 pounds of blackberries out of that particular piece of roll that he had there. Um, we had, I attended this school here until grade five. It went up to grade... When I first started here, we went up to grade eight, I think it was, and then they went down back to grade six. But uh, we went, we were here till grade five. Then they built the new school at Cordova Bay. So we attended there for grade six. And after grade six, we went over to Mount Newton for grade seven and eight, and then it got too full. So they decided at that point to, um, everybody in the Royal Oak and Elk Lake area were all, were all shipped out to uh, North Saanich High School, I don't know if you remember going up North Saanich for grade, let's see, uh, 9 and 10 was out at North Saanich for two years. Then after that they built the new school back at Royal Oak again, and that's where we ended up with grade 11 and 12. So it was a, we got, I knew every student in one end of Saanich to the other at one point there because we, every year they shuffled us on to the next school. And I can remember, I can think of what the, the commotion would be now if your students were shipped off to different parts of the district for each year, but nobody asked any questions, and that was it. <clears throat> anyway, we graduated from Royal Oak. I, I enjoy, we, enjoyed Royal Oak. we enjoyed Royal Oak very much because it was a brand new school, and not like the old schools. You had the wooden floors with the oiled floors, and it just seemed so nice down there. And the first annual from Royal Oak was called the Swamp Log. I think that was the name of the first annual that came out with, because it was such a bog down there the first couple of years. They, they fixed it. They tore it. In the meantime, all the schools I attended have all been torn down except this one. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kurovi is still there. It's a bit bigger, but the North Sandwich has been, has been just been torn down, and Mount Newton was closed many years ago, and they've torn down the one at Royal Oak and it rebuilt it. So, uh, after graduation, um, Jack Armstrong had a large poultry farm next to our place, and he asked me if I'd like to go to work, help come to work for him. That was after grade 12, so I started working with Jack Armstrong and, and I was there, I was on the farm for 36 years at Claremont Poultry and we had at one point we had 30,000 birds on that farm laying birds and initially when we first started back when we when I first started there we had I think it was 5,000 birds on hand but they're all raised out on range 
So he spent all summer long bring, catching chickens out of the trees and kept bringing them into the barns. And then after we started getting problems with two-legged predators, that's the human ones. Raccoons, you go out and coon hunts on night time, trying to keep the raccoons out of the chickens. But anyway, I was there for 36 years until I, when the farm had to move because the population was moving out toward the farm in that area and people didn't like farm chickens nearby, so the farm moved out to North Saanich and it was at that point I decided I didn't want to get involved in a farm again for another 30 some odd years, so I retired from the Claremont poultry. I was married in 1965. Yeah, I realized that a few years later, I think that was by arrangement too, because my mother decided that at age of 29 I shouldn't be, still be at home. So, so, <laughs> so she and Kathleen Tucky got together, I'm sure, along with Jean Manis, or Jean Tucky at that time. Jean worked at the Bank of Montreal down at Roanoke, and there was a girl down there named Ellen Walker who worked at the bank too, and Jean thought, hmm, maybe Peter and she could get together. So we went out. She arranged for a party, and we went to this party, and I'll see you later sort of thing. Then <laughs> two weeks later, I started getting Kathleen Tuck. said, haven't you phoned Ellen yet? I said, no, no, <laughs> but don't you think you should? <laughs> and mom, then mom got going on it too. said, don't you think you should phone Ellen? So I said, well, I did. And a year later, we got married. And, and so we had, we had our three children, um, all in fairly quick succession. I call them Eeny, Miney, and No Mo. Eeny, Miney, Eeny, Miney. Eeny, Miney, Eeny, Miney, Miney, Mo. Yeah, okay. And, and No Mo was at the end there, so we didn't have any more after that. But in the meantime, I've now have six grandchildren, and they're all well, the eldest one is 16 years old, and he's and my daughter, and sons, and he's 16, and he's six foot five almost. And I don't know where they get all this. I was the runt of the family, obviously, because you know, the grandchildren are all heads taller than I am now. But I have been coming across. It's been very interesting since we coming here, going through all the old photo albums, which I hadn't looked at for well since we were youngsters, because Dad took lots of photos. Then he could, then they got into the um, he was into slides for many, many years, so those ones never get looked at because they're not in an album, so it's too hard to look at slides. But, but it's, finding all these photographs here that you hadn't looked at for the last 50 years is kind of one. I find one continually looks at the, you're looking at the background of the pictures, not the people in it, it's the background that changes so much. You know. It's quite interesting. Anyway, that's. Peter? Oh, God. Yes. You had some uh, old pioneer neighbors, didn't you? Like uh, Van Trite? Oh yeah, well Sid Van Trite was above us, lived on Halliburton. Um, Sid Van Trite, his grandson is David Foster. And they were, <coughs> and the Foster family, I don't think had that any relation to you, Daryl, or is that? Just a cousin. Cousins. And David, I remember, just, just a cousin anyway. But uh, yes, the uh, Van Trites, I remember the, the Foster children up there, I remember, I, I think I babysat David once, but when he was a very youngster, but he wouldn't remember me anymore. But uh, and we had the, the Tuckies were up that way, the, up our way on Halliburton. There was a lot of a lot of one one person shacks all scattered all through the tree, all through the well across the ridge. There, there Jimmy Muldoon lived next near us. He was a he had one of the better houses. He he when he came, he was the <clears throat> when the CPR was building the Princess boat ships or whatever from, from England. When they brought the ships over from England. The carpenters would come with the ships, and Jimmy Muldoon was one of the ones. He he was in charge of building the railings for the ships and all that type of thing. So he, but he was a great carpenter. But he was there again. He was a single man. He just he loved his. He grew many berries, but he turned them all into wine and whatever else you could make out of berries. Anything anything drinkable, he made it. And there's another one. Stan Gray lived up the road from us. He had cherry orchard, and he had a still there too, and and. At least we all thought it was. And who else did we have? Um, there were the Fords and the, the Lydiards. Remember, I guess, it, remember uh, Marion Lydiard and Ken. 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 They, they lived up on the hill with us. And I don't know, a lot of people. And, and the Winterburns, Audrey and George Winterburn and Bruce. Uh, Bruce is the only one left in that family now. George has passed away and Audrey's passed away. And the Tuckies, well, as I mentioned, the Tuckies, they're scattered about. Uh, Dick Tucky still lives in the old, lives in the family home, house. Uh, 
Brenda lives over at Gordon Headway, and Jean lives up island. Susan lives on the mainland. And the Greens, well, there's a John and Fred, Fred and John Green, they were part of the neighborhood too for many years. And there's lots of people up there that, and the other, well, the other old timers, the Olivers, they had the dairy farm up here where the Royal Oak Inn was. Ray Oliver, he passed away about seven years ago. Uh, Can you tell us what happened to your brother Gordon? He passed away in 2000. Um, he, was in the, he was in the banking business for, well, he was a banker for many years and he was on the inspection. My father died in 1995, he was 95. My mother died in 1998 and she was 91. But my father had been had had a stroke back when he was 81, so he he lived 14 years in the Gorge Road Hospital, but, but he couldn't he couldn't talk and couldn't walk. Judy, my sister, she lives in Abbotsford. She she her her husband was a school teacher in Abbotsford. For they re, he retired quite a few years ago now, so they're still over there. And they have the, the three children, and we're all carrying on the best we can. Initially, we'll go back beyond Royal Oak, and it's, it goes back a few hundred years, perhaps, because I'm trying to figure out how to get my relations to this spot. Anyway, um, my sister and I recently applied for and got our certificate for U UEL certificate, because it turns out one of our relations was a United Empire loyalist, and so I, um, we, to get your certificate, you have to prove all the connections from all the relations from the beginning up till now, so it requires wills and Bibles and anyway, my sister and I, we managed to come up with all the necessary information to require and I thought the best way to do it is I will read a, one page of what we produced. It's a, it's a story of Captain Michael Grass. Michael Grass, the founder of Kingston, was born in Strasbourg in 1732. Strasbourg had been captured by the French in 1681, but Michael was of German, not French, descent. He left Strasbourg in 1752 and journeyed first to England and thence to America. Apparently he left Strasbourg to avoid being conscripted into the French army as he was of a military age. Whatever the reason for his departure from Europe, Michael Grass landed in Pennsylvania on September 22, 1752, where he married his first wife, Mary Ann, who taught him to speak and write English. After her death, he married Margaret Swartz and had a son, Peter. He, sent some, he spent some time in Philadelphia, where he worked as a trade, as a sold saddler. During the Seven Years' War, Michael Grass was a prisoner of the French at Fort Frontenac, today Kingston, but escaped and returned to New York State where he f farmed as well as carrying on as a saddler. At the time of the American Revolution, he was asked to fight in the Patriot Militia, but he refused to serve. So in March of 1777, leaving his farm and family, he went to New York City, which was still under British control. In the following February, in Sh Checkton Teddy Committee of Safety seized the farm and saddle business, causing Margaret and the family to flee to New York. In 1783, he was granted a captain's commission in the New York City Militia Co Company No. 2, with instructions to lead eight companies of associated loyalists in a convoy to Co Quebec City, and then to establish a new settlement near the outlet of Lake Ontario. The eight groups boarded ships and sailed from New York when they arrived in Sorrel, near Quebec City, the large numbers created a problem with accommodation. The governor of Quebec wished to send them east to Nova Scotia, Cape Breton and the Bay of Chaleur, but Michael Grass was determined to go west. Governor Haldimand wrote to London that he was making preparations agreeable to their request for a settlement of loyalists near Kakuri. He commented that Grass and his people were persist in the desire to settle there. Grass and a number of his party were dispatched to Katuri to help in the fall preparations for spring arrival. Most of the party returned to Sorrel for the winter, leaving a skeleton party of 19 brave souls behind. In spite of winter, 
quarrels, it was Michael Grass's persistence that helped make this become an area for loyalist settlement. Thus it came about the creation of Katakuri and the, ultimately the foundation of Kingston. That's now in Ontario. From the estimated 1,500 persons who left New York, little more than 300 journeyed to Katakuri. The considerable loss of numbers reflects the trials and tribulations of exile and migration. Some panic-stricken refugees would have sought would have sought last-minute alternatives, and some would have attracted to be attracted to towns like Quebec and Montreal, where employment may have been available. Some would have been given up hope and returned to their homes. Never to be, nevertheless, a little more than a hundred heads of families or adult males of the associated loyalists settled in Kakuri or nearby Adolfs, Adolfston under the terms of settlement. The settlers were promised a five-year supply of groceries and supplies which never materialized. There were some suggestions that Michael earned a reputation as storyteller in his late, later years, and his stories may have stretched the facts somewhat. But in any case, there is no doubt about the rigors endured by these early settlers. Michael died in 1813. His will begins, in the name of the Lord, Amen. As it is a certain thing that all human creatures must die and none in, ten, none in life can escape the divine judgment, forasmuch I, Michael Grass, farmer in the township of Kingston, North America, being, being well, thanks to God, in health and sound in mind, but fearing the perils of human life and wishing to dispose of the properties that the Almighty God, our Lord, has committed to me in this mortal life, do make, constitute, and ordain this pre present testament for my last will. Later in the will he states, if my daughter Eve has a son and bears the name Michael Grass, he shall have a hundred acres. And if my son Peter has a son that bears the name Michael, the said Michael shall have a hundred acres of land. Needless to say, both named their sons accordingly. And that was the end of that bit that we produced. And here's the, the, the plaque we got as uh, for being UEL which I would like to pass around if, any, if you'd like to have a look at it. Anyway, I think that's enough out of me, so thank you very much for your attention. If you've got any...